a great pleasure to be speaking with Edwin Dende, the CEO of Saiten. Edwin, thank you for making time for us today. Thanks a lot, Ali Khan. Glad to host you uh, one more time. Thank you. Edwin, we haven't spoken for a number of months, and uh, I was looking through the news flow, and so much has ha happened at Saiten. Would you care to characterize our, uh, to us what's happened in the last few months? Fund manager license I'm aware of, a whole series, funding came in, would you care to tell us what's been going on in the business? For sure. Uh, mm. A lot has been going on. Mm. Uh, and maybe uh, the, the, general, the general context mm. for Cyton, especially over the last few years, is to take advantage of a difficult marketing, a market environment mm. when people are distracted and to grow as fast as possible because when markets are difficult, you can get talent at a reasonable price and you can get very attractive assets at reasonable, reasonable valuation. So that's the theme over the, uh, over the last uh, few months and actually I would say over the last few, uh, few years. Now if I were to go to specifics, uh, I would look at it in terms of our key pillars. In terms of people, we've continued to grow. The last time we talked, maybe we were 300. What are you now? Currently we're around 500 people, oh mainly on the sales distribution side because you have to stay very close to uh, your client. As the banking sector continues to, to struggle, we take advantage of that to try and get very good uh, people with bank experience because they, they are the access to the high net worth uh, individuals. In terms of product and services, uh, a lot has happened. Uh, we announced uh, an acquisition of a four acre prime piece of land that we are now at the tail end uh, of closing. Uh, we are announcing this week, I can't uh, give the name yet, an acquisition of a serviced uh, office uh, brand, almost 50% uh, uh, stake. I think, I don't know, by the time we met last time whether we had made the acquisition of Superior Homes or we had just announced you that. You just uh, announced it. Yeah, yes. so that now uh, we've already uh, closed. I think in another one month, we are mm. going to announce an acquisition of a stake in a hospitality uh, brand. Again, given where the conversations and where the mm. documentation is, uh, we can't uh, uh, give the brand at, at this point. So essentially continuing to expand the brand. You mm. talked about the uh, asset management license. When we talked last time, we were purely a private markets uh, player. Now we're also playing in the public market, which means we'll be able to offer product to, for unit trust uh, players and within, uh, within a short period of time also to pension funds through the capital markets licensing of the site on asset managers. Now we got the asset management company license. Instead of spending another few months to try and get licensing for now the specific funds that we'll offer to clients, we also announced and are closing the acquisition of Seriani Asset Managers. Seriani has one of the highest rated money market funds, highest yielding money market funds in the market. So pretty much on products, a lot has happened. Processes, we continue to strengthen our process. And on distribution and sales, I've talked about it. They are the majority of the firm. So that growth from 300 to 500, most of it, or almost substantially most all of it, is on the sales sides of the business. So quite a bit of stuff. Uh, that's, that's a lot. And there's a lot of M&A activity you've, you've done in the last few months, basically. What informs that strategy? Are you finding it more attractive to do bolt-on acquisitions <coughs> than, to go, than to go the organic way? Remember, at the core of Cyton, we are an investment company. We take capital from our clients, whether individual high net worth investors, whether uh, institutional investors uh, such as Talleri or whether diaspora. We get capital. What we have promised them is an above average attractive return. Mm. To deliver that return, then you have to find a home for the money. Our first home was real estate. Mm. That's why we have 10 projects under mandate, adding to 82 billion uh, Kenya shillings. So we didn't want to have just real estate as the place to invest. So the next place we went into was financial services. Mm. I think the last time it, uh, we talked, we talked about our stake in uh, KCB. Mm -hmm. Now we've taken another stake in uh, uh, NIC. NIC. So I think you were the seventh biggest shareholder in NIC. Or now we're actually the fifth uh, largest shareholder in NIC. We like the valuation, we like the management, we like uh, the ethos of the core shareholders. So we'll just continue to build our stake until a point where we feel that we've gotten it to where we need to be. So mm -hmm. 
moved from real estate to financial services. From financial services, we went into things that were, I would say, uh, related mm. to the real estate business, hence education. Mm. When you put up uh, 100 acres of uh, real estate, as we are doing in River and in Ruiru, you have to provide early childhood, primary schools. So are you branding the schools or you're, or you're partnering with people? We're actually branding the schools, hence site on education. Uh, services, which is actually up and running, has mm -hmm. a business manager gentleman uh, by the name Ben uh, Ikenye. We've opened our first campus yes. in, uh, that? in town, yes. Queen, Queensway. We've started with tertiary education because we need to train whether it's carpenters, masons, mm -hmm. plumbers for our own real estate. So that's yeah. that's the kind of European apprenticeship uh, philosophy, right? That yeah. people get trained in a trade. And uh, that's, is, is, uh, but that's purely to feed your own pipeline, you're saying? Our own pipeline will be the catalyst, mm -hmm. but they have to go out and compete just like any other college and deliver the return on investment, deliver the best mm -hmm. education. We say they have to focus on creating uh, sharp minds. So our own product is kind of a stepping stone, but ultimately they have to be independent and compete in the market and produce talent just like any other. Yeah. Uh, college. So that's the education. Hospitality? Then hospitality. We have a site on hospitality. We hired a gentleman uh, called uh, David Ndava mm -hmm. who is leading the hospitality team. As I said, they found their first property. They are really at the advanced stages in terms of getting that deal and I think within the next one or two months you'll hear here is our mm -hmm. first hospitality step. So real estate as the, as the core around it education around it, hospitality, then financial uh, services, which is our investments in banking sector, whether it's KCB, whether it's NIC, and of course now uh, site on uh, asset managers. And we're getting to a point where we feel that we've proven the concept yes. uh, in East Africa, and it's time to now look at other regions. Where can we also so tell us do a little this? bit about that? I mean, so we, we well, well, where are you looking? Outside Kenya, have you got anything? Outside Kenya, we are looking at something in uh, in uh, Kampala. Yes. We, we are in uh, advanced stages of a JV with a JV partner. But if you follow our research, you'll notice that you went we, west. We went west mm. and started covering mm. uh, Ghana, Ghana and, yeah. and Nigeria. Mm. One of the acquisitions we are announcing very soon has presence mm. in, in uh, both Lagos and Accra. So they will help us get to those regions uh, much quicker. And then we'll get staff seated there and then they'll start looking at the same things we look at here. They look at real estate, they look at education, hospitality, asset management and see what can we do there that mm. is correlated with what we are doing here. So the strategy still is the same playing in those sectors, and now going west. Wow, it's really, you've, you've really done a lot since I saw you last, uh, Ed, Edwin. Yeah. Uh, As a team. Yes, yeah. no, of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, with 500 people, if, if it's not a team, it's not going to be working. No, well done. And I, I, I must compliment you on that, because I, I see you put a lot of energy into building the team, the training, education of the team. I, I mean, we, since we've been uh, working with you, I've really noticed that there's a lot of effort going in in terms of lifting the level of the of your staff, and I think it's really a positive sign from what I can see. And, and if you look at majority of our people, mm. we got them from college. Just yes. look at, at Saiton. Most of the people who are running uh, functions, who are running uh, projects, they are people who we have trained. They've grown over three years, so we feel that having the right culture mm. is more important than the experience. When we get people you who fit our the life, they can get the experience. And you'll also notice more and more mm. the founding team is pulling backwards so mm. that we can now develop the next generation mm. of leaders for site. And it's, it, it's going to be very hard to find me on TV these days or yes. in press conferences. You think about the last time you saw me or the last time you saw Elizabeth or the last time you saw Patricia, the co-founders mm. now. Shiv is much younger yes. than us, so he's still uh, in the forefront. But we are working very hard to bring the next level of senior managers yeah, to be the face of the firm. And that's an excellent, I think that's an excellent development. About 10 days ago, I attended a function uh, at the New Stanley where I think um, it was uh, Taleri, uh, who have been a partner of yours for some time. 
and they were committing, I think, an additional $21 million equivalent. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was there at the ceremony and the gentleman made a very, very positive um, uh, uh, intervention for about five minutes and he was talking about how they support you and how they've been delighted with the returns you've provided and anybody, frankly, writing a $21 million check has to be delighted with something, mm -hmm. other, yes. So tell us a little bit about that relationship and, and you know, is, are you growing it? Do you see a bigger opportunity there? Um, when I spoke with him afterwards, he was extremely uh, confident and bullish about yourselves. And I was just wondering, you know, that kind of enthusiasm, what, what's going on there? Yeah. T T Taleria has been a good story. Uh, we met the uh, Africa representative, a gentleman called uh, Anti. Yes. Uh, in what I would call the worst of circumstances in the context of the site on story. That was in 2014. We just left our previous platform. We had a whole bunch of uh, lawsuit, lawsuits. But um, Ante knew the team. And uh, good investors know a good team when they see it because they understand that to deliver, uh, you need a team. And you need a team that has worked together and a team that has a track record. So I think he looked at the team and said, I know these guys. I know their track record, and this is the time when I can actually come in, sit with them on the table, and do a deal that makes sense both to them and to Taleri. People did not know that amidst all those lawsuits and chaos, we were actually engaged intensely in 2014 up to Christmas Eve, drafting documents where we got our first 1.5 billion. That was our first institutional uh, investor, and that made that all the difference. Year. That was in 2014 when we signed, and we got it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And that's the funding that actually helped us get started in Situ Village in mm -hmm. Karen, and also Amara Ridge, the product we've just mm -hmm. delivered. They were the uh, financiers. So that was the first investment uh, in both Amara and Situ. Then they invested in the ALMA, mm -hmm. our 500 uh, unit. They are the people who gave us the funding to actually buy the land. When we started selling, then mm -hmm. uh, we exited them. So th that's another uh, project that they've uh, exited. And then the latest one, which is the 21 uh, million or, or 2.1 billion, that funding is earmarked for the ridge. Mm -hmm. But remember how we operate, we have what by the last time we were here, we were talking about the site on cash management mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. We've now evolved it into the site on high yield uh, solutions. All our projects, whatever money they have, they have to bank mm -hmm. with uh, what we would call our in house bank, mm -hmm. which is the cash management solution or the high yield uh, solution. And that high yield solution then funds all these activities. Mm -hmm at a rate whereby we can then support the 18% that yes. we promised to our investors. So the funding is earmarked for the rich, it's banked with our in-house bank, and then it's accessible. So essentially, mm. if you look at it, it is 2.1 billion that goes to increase the assets that Cyton is managing, which uh, currently with that investment, I think we now move to 22 billion from the 20 billion we had before. Wow, yeah. it's been an extraordinary rise. Let me just ask you, going back to the cash management <coughs> tool, which you've now recharacterized as a high, high yield, yield solution. High yield solution. What is the quantum now you've got in under that high yield solution? Under high yield solutions, and I think now. Are you still now, at 18%? Yeah, we are still at 18%. Yes. High yield solution, I would say currently we are at about 11 billion. The last yes. time we talked, we were probably at 8 billion. That's right. Yeah. So you've, 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 you've seen good demand for it. And I mean, it's a very handsome product, right? It continues I to grow. I can't think of many other products of that nature which are paying out yeah. that, kind of, that kind of money. And, and, and every time somebody says that, Ali Khan, it really surprises me because yes. I ask them, but how much are you paying for yes. your loans no, that's uh, right. at the bank as a business? If a real estate developer today and uh, goes out to a bank and asks for a loan, mm. yes, they'll tell you it's 14, but then add all yes. the costs. You are still at 16 and 18, mm. and it's at the Kenya Bankers Association credit cost of credit website. Just yes. pick a bank, take one year money, mm. the average is still 18. Mm. So there's nothing we are doing that is out of this world. We have just changed things a little bit. Instead of you taking your one million to the bank, you get zero. Mm. I go borrow it, I pay an all-in cost mm. of 18%. I just come to you directly mm. 
and I get it, and I pay you the 18%. Now, the only reason why we are the only person doing it is that we are the only person who actually takes the money and does the development for yes. the sake of the investor. Everybody develops for mm. themselves. So yes. they go borrow money, then they develop. For us, we are saying we will develop for the sake of supporting the 18% mm. return. Mm. That's why with all the attacks mm. that people have um, directed towards the high yield fund or the cash management, it continues to grow because our investors understand the structure. They go out and actually look at the real estate mm. and they can see the real estate continues to grow. So it's a, it's a fund that's very stable and continues to grow. So let me ask you a question, just <coughs> doing the maths. You've got 11B uh, uh, in, in the high yield. You've got another t uh, t 2.1, uh, uh, sorry, 21, mm. is that correct? How much are you, a cash are you, have you got for the pipeline at the moment? In total, it's 21. Yeah. It breaks out to a, around 11 mm. in terms of uh, uh, cash management solution, yeah. or high yield solution. I'm still yes. making the transition from mm -hmm. CMS to HYS. Okay. Around 11 billion in HYS as a high yield solution. Then another 5 billion mm. uh, from Tallery that gets to around 15, 16 there. Yes. Then another 4 billion that comes in terms of JV, land contribution, because yes. capital can be in terms of cash, it can also be in kind in terms of people who brought land to us. So the total uh, capital that we have is 21 mm. billion. High net worth investors, Tallery, land joint ventures. And is that sufficient to support the 82 billion pipeline or do you still have to go out into the market? And look? We have to go out and raise another 60 billion. Yes. But remember, we don't want it all now. It, that's what I mean. It's yeah. never going to be all at once, is yeah. it? Yeah. So it, actually the way we raise cash is that if we see a lot of cash coming, we could do two things. We could go get more projects, which is what we are doing now, mm. or we could lower our rates to slow down mm. the incoming cash. But that 82 billion is what we shall need yes. over the yeah. five, seven year period for some of these projects. If you take a thousand acres in mm. Athi River, mm. it's going to be a 15 year uh, project. But on average, I would say it's five to seven years to deliver on all this uh, project. So of the 82, we already have 22. We need mm. to get another 60 yeah. billion. Yeah. It's a, it's a very bold, but you, it, it really you've executed. You released your, your results a, a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, what I, when, as I was reading those results, I saw somebody who was growing a business, was growing it fast, looking to capture an opportunity. It reminded me of sometimes of some of these internet companies where you take a bit of a hit in year one and year two because you're putting your platform in place, you're putting the personnel, you're building a platform for five years in advance. You're not building it for today because in a week it's going to be too small. And I saw a few people sort of comment on that uh, aspect of the results, you know, the operating expenses, for example. Give us your take on, on the results and how we should be interpreting them. Obviously, they are our results, so mm. I'll, I'll talk about them from uh, my perspective. Yes. But I think there are two issues. One. If you are innovating, mm. you can innovate as what I would call a small enterprise, where you say, I'm going to create this one, one shop and start selling something, and the cash comes in mm. immediately. Or you can inno innovate as an enterprise, where you want to replicate the idea mm. um, very quickly, get market share. If I could use examples, uh, things like Uber, you'll have to make a lot of investments up front. Now, if you're innovating as an individual or a mom and pop, one shop kind of um, uh, idea, then of course your earnings are just going to grow up. If you're innovating for, as an enterprise where you want a certain amount of market share, as you're saying, you're gonna see kind of a J curve. You're gonna go down mm -hmm. and then rise up very rapidly. So there's, a, there's a, a, quite a bit of that in our results where we are making major investments in technology, major investments in people. Uh, you are talking about what has changed. One of the things I didn't mention is that the last time we talked, I think we were three offices in Nairobi. Now we are five offices in Nairobi, plus Nyeri, plus Kisumu, plus Nakuru. So we need to get closer 
uh, to our clients. So those investments in terms of offices, rent, people, connectivity, we are going to see it in our results. Now, sophisticated investors, institutional investors, and people who are looking for value understand that, that you're going to take some hit uh, at this point so that you build that market share. The other thing that's going on is that the nature of our business. Uh, real estate is front heavy in terms of capital. You have to make the investments today and then you have to collect most of it at the tail end. So you are going to see quite a bit of fair value gains. Now, I've seen some uh, people query the fair value gain component. Why don't you describe to us what a fair value gain is? I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll use a very simple example. Let's say I buy land mm. for two million shillings uh, today and then I put another eight million of costs on it, whether it's construction costs, whether it's financing costs, the total cost of producing the unit is let's say 10 million shillings. I come to you today, and I'm not incurring the entire 10 million today, I'm gonna incur it over let's say two years of construction, but I know my total cost is 10 million. I come and sell you the house today for 15 million. You, we have a sale agreement, you have to perform. You've even given me 10% mm. up front. If you don't perform, I, I, I've made 10% uh, or 50, I've made 1.5 million mm. uh, right off the bat. So in most, if I look at our defaults, they are less than 1%. So Is that most, right? Yeah, in terms of people who mm. buy and then don't follow through. Mm. Once they've put the 10% down, I don't have the number, but it has to be mm. way lower than 1%. One, 1%. I'm just using 1% mm. to demonstrate how low the rate of default uh, is. So I have revenues here of 15 million. They are going to come over three years. I have costs here of 10 million. I have a fair value gain of 5 million. Now, I don't book of all of it up front. Mm. How much do you book? I book based on percentage completion. Mm. If I've completed, and all, all of this is, is not based on what we decide. Mm. It is based on accounting standards, mm. uh, which are imposed on us by international bodies and audited by uh, our accountant, Grant Thornton, mm. who's one of the six largest accountants uh, in the world. So if I've finished 50% of the construction, I will book 50% of the fair value gain, which is going to be two and a half million. Now, out of that uh, fair value gain, some I will have received in cash based on our payment method. So if you are, for example, a, a mortgage buyer who gave me 10% upfront, and then we've agreed that the 90% you can only give me at the end because your bank is saying, I need the house built mm -hmm. before I give you all the all the 15 million. So mm. all they gave you is the, all, all you did was to put the 1.5 mm. from your pocket mm. and the balance, 13 and a half, you'll go get from a bank. I will recognize half of the gain, mm. though I have not received the money mm. from you. Mm. So that's why it doesn't make sense to look at our results and back out the fair value gain because it's operating fair value gain. It is not incidental yes. to my operations. It's not like I'm a hospital that is sitting on land that happens to appreciate. I wake up every day it looking for business. land, constructing and selling and collecting when it's due. So when people say, oh, if you take out the fair value gain, then they made a loss. Clearly they don't understand the business. No. The fair value gain is, part of the is business. not just part of the business. Mm -hmm. It's the core pursuit of the business. Mm -hmm for the real estate business. You wake up every day when, when your laborers go to site. Mm. They are not going to sell houses, they are going to construct, and in that construction, they're increasing your mm. fair value gain. So fair value gain is actually what we wake up to pursue every single day. So when somebody says, back out the fair mm. value gain, it's sense. like going to a school where yeah. they've admitted students, mm. and the students have only paid a deposit and they have a payment plan, mm. then they say back out the receivable in fees to see how much cash they have. You can't back out the receivable. They have a contract with the student. The student will pay over, over, the, over the term. So anybody who knows us cannot back out. In fact, they should be asking how much is the fair value gain growing? I need mm. to see a growth in fair yes. value gain. I need to growth, see growth in your sales. I need to see growth in your land mm. banking. It is a core metric mm. of valuing the firm.
No, thanks for addressing that, because there's been quite a bit of scepticism, I thought, around that. But I, you're completely correct. I mean, you've made an investment, the investment has appreciated, and you're taking it on a pro rata basis. And the investment, mm. there's a contract yes. in terms of the sale of that investment. Mm. The one thing I'm not sure I would agree, Ali Khan, is that there's real noise, mm. because the people who understand the business are very comfortable. If there was real noise, then you'd hear Tallery or one of our yes. 3,000 investments complaining. When you have a new idea, like the high yield solutions or the cash management uh, solution, it's threatening to someone. Because ask yourself, so this 11 billion, mm. where did you get it? We didn't come from thin air. These were people who were getting substandard returns in the banking sector. We managed to convince them to move that 11 billion from somewhere to Cyton. Of course, where it came from, they are not happy. Now, you can do one of two things. You can also you can say, what product can I innovate so that I compete with Cyton? Or you can say, how can I shake the confidence of the people who invested that 11 billion so that it might come back? So, what you will see, what seems like noise is actually kind of a designed plan. Our real investors don't question the fair value gains. They understand it. So when you say that there have been some questions mm. around uh, our accounts or uh, uh, the interpretation, it is just a section of the market and it is a deliberate design mm. where they take something that is core to the business, they take it out and then present some sort of Shaky, uh, shaky, uh, shaky situation so that they can try and shake the confidence of our investors. And the reason is very clear. The 11 billion that we have in our high yield solutions came from somewhere. It came from the banking sector. Now, the banking sector can do one of two things. They can compete and create products for people who are looking for high yield. Not everybody just wants a deposit rate. Some people want a high yield rate. Or they can find a way to try and shake confidence. Unfortunately, to, uh, they've chosen the second route, which is to try and shake it's confidence. It's a low-cost option as well. It's a low-cost option for now, but in the end, it does the happen. investors kind of realize, wait a minute, you told me these people have issues, mm -hmm. now I understand. Are you really telling me the truth or you're trying to get my money mm -hmm. at a cheaper rate? And I would say that most investors are not stupid. You can yeah. shake their confidence for a minute, and in fact, the people who ask us questions when these things are said tend to be people who've been with us for less than three months. Those who've been with us for a long time understand yeah. the strategy. And, and it's very deliberate because when you ask a client, where did you hear this from? It tends to be from a relationship manager mm. who lost money, mm. uh, who, who lost business from the bank to Cyton. So they go take this stuff in social media, they send it to their client and say, look, I told you, can you bring the money back? So a lot of this is not people asking. It's being generated from one sector oh, of the economy. And, you know, you've had some, uh, uh, of, I, I don't know how to characterize it, some of this content is, you know, you've had the blog, some bloggers who've sort of run with some of these stories that we're touching on. They seem to regurgitate the same thing. When I dive into it, I don't really find much content, but it creates a bit of drama and hysteria. I thought you described it best <laughs> in a response a week ago when you called them nitwits and sad <laughs> in Trumpian capital letters. So tell us, you know, are, are these like flies that come and bite you on and off? What, what would you, how would you put it? Ali Khan, I'll go back to a statement I made earlier. If you have any product mm. that threatens the established players, they won't take it lying down. The quick examples I could give is M-Pesa. Yes. Banks fought M-Pesa until a point reached where they had to collaborate with M-Pesa. Equity Bank, when it started mm. 13 years ago as a build, from a building society to a commercial bank, how many times have you heard people saying Equity Bank is going down, it's collapsing, but today it's the largest bank by market capitalization. There is no option but when there is a banking issue to be discussed, Equity Bank has to be on the table. When we started high yield solutions or then cash management solutions, it was threatening uh, to people and it continues to be threatening to people. And they said all manner of things um, against uh, Cyton. They 
went to all manner of regulators and said whatever they could say. But today, Cyton has a fund management license. Today, Cyton is acquiring a fund manager with unit trust uh, licenses. So what you see in social media, and when you see the people who are generating it, these are people who, for lack of a better word, I'll just call it what it is, they're guns for hire, everybody knows. Mm. So the question is, who is paying them to write these things about Cyton? So there's got to be somebody who's business, an established person who feels their business is threatened, they cannot innovate, therefore they will hire, and there are usually two or three names, I don't want to name them, but everybody knows them, there are two or three names who you go to with content that doesn't make sense, it is essentially mudslinging content, you put it on social media, usually Twitter, Facebook, then their relationship managers pick it from social media and send it to our clients and tell clients, I told you mm. there is a problem. How come mainstream media is not writing? How come analysts mm. are not writing? Our board of high yield solution is made up of bankers, private equity investors, directors in companies. They are comfortable. So why is it that it's only two or three bloggers who everybody knows is a blogger for hire, who tends to write about Cyton. This is not coming from social media. It's coming from some threatened established players. But what, what do they say? You cannot stop mm. innovation. Mm. You can only kind of put roadblocks. You can distract it. But ultimately, the reason why Uber works is because people like to take cabs using technology rather than hailing down cabs on the road. The reason why Equity Bank grew is that the lower, uh, the unbanked wanted a bank and Equity created that bank. The reason why M-Pesa works is that people want to transfer money without necessarily going to a banking hall. What's your raison d'etre then, so, uh, according to those? Anybody yeah. who has money. Yes. Surely, they would rather get 18% on their 1 million than take it to the bank to get 0%. So you'll have to do a lot mm. for them to take money away from us and go back mm. to getting 0%. Now the question is, can I support the 18%? Mm. Yes, I go choose things to, uh, to invest in, real estate, hospitality, education, to support the 18%. As long as I have the return on one side, and our returns are usually 22 to 25%. And as long as I deliver to you 18%, these guys can make all the noise you, they want. It is unlikely you will move. And even if you move back, after three months, you'll realize this was noise anyway. Most of the clients who take their money end up coming back anyway, because at least, uh, maybe at some point, they'll be a competitor. But at this point, there's no way they'll get 18% per annum. What is the secret sauce to you consistently delivering these returns of around 22 to 25%? What's the secret sauce? Because obviously, that's how you're going to pay your 18. Actually, this 22 mm. to 25% is available in the market and other developers are also mm. getting it. The 22 to 25, that's not the innovation. That one, all other developers, even Surai, are getting the 22 to 25%. They're able to cluster around that. Exactly. Okay. The only difference is... Yes. To get the 22 to 25%, you have to borrow at 18 all-in cost. The only difference is they go to the bank mm. to borrow. And where does the bank get the money? They get the money from you. Mm. So the only difference is they are doing the conventional trade. Ali Khan goes to the bank, puts one, one million. At best, you get 7%. A developer goes and pays the 18% uh, cost of borrowing from the bank. And it takes a whole process, a whole one year. So our innovation is not on the return. Mm. Our innovation is disintermediating the bank by coming directly to you. The same way Apple decided enterprise uh, entities might don't understand my product. I'm go going to go directly to the consumer and sell them this proposition of an iPhone. I'll open the stores and go directly to them. And they never even sold you with any information, right? It was just intuitive, you learned it. Yeah, and that's, if you ask yourself, why are our numbers growing? Mm. It's growing on the sales side. Why are our offices growing? We want to speak directly to the client. If we try to sell these returns to you, or if we try to get these returns to you, 
through some sort of fund manager or pension fund. They don't understand it. They will take us through hoops. So why do I have to get the returns to you through a pension fund, some enterprise or some institution, or through some unit trust funds? I can come directly to you and tell you, Ali Khan, here's 18%. This is how I'm generating it. And I will get your one million much faster than I'll get it through an enterprise, such as an asset manager, an insurance company, or a pension fund. So that's all we've done. Mm. The returns, everybody can get them. Yes. But how to fund that business, that's our innovation. We've yes. gone directly to the individual. But also, I mean, looking at the products you've been putting out, you've innovated highly on that side as well. I mean, I've got to compliment you on that because we've, we've looked at so many of them. And uh, again, going back to Tallery, he was also talking. He said, you know, the old way of doing business is gone. You've got to deliver a much more sophisticated product. Um, uh, how do you characterize your execution on that side then? For sure. Uh, mm. Our execution on that side, um, the differentiation first and foremost is market research. We do a lot of research because if you have the information where people want to live, where people want to buy houses, if you build, they will live there in terms of renting or they'll buy. So when I talk about we are doing 10, 10 developments, if you really dig through it, we only do three things. We are either developing in Karen. Karen has the highest concentration of high-end private schools anywhere in Kenya. So in both good and bad economic times, people still will want to send their kids. They'll cut down on other things, but where the kid goes to school, they'll still want to send their kids to good schools. And Karen is not only a place, a destination for Kenyan kids. If you look at schools like Brookhouse, there are a lot of kids there from South Sudan, mm. from Uganda, from Rwanda. Kenya is still a destination for education for the region. Mm. So that's why we like Karen, and we have three products there. The one we delivered, which is a marriage, C2 uh, village, uh, 30 acres, which we are starting on. And lately, we bought another 10 acres. Uh, it's called uh, Upward. Mm. Uh, so three products in one location. Why? Because of the fundamentals that uh, uphold the area, underpin uh, the region, which the area which is education. Second is Kiambu County. Mm. Of the 10 fastest growing towns in Kenya with a population of 50,000 people and above, six of them are in Kiambu County. So the demographic, um, uh, the demographic support is there. That's why we have in just one spine for mm. products. Taraji, which is around, I think, 300 units. Then Alma, which is around 500 units. Then uh, the Ridge, which is around 800 units. And then um, uh, Riveran in Ruiru, which is around 2,000 units. So we are developing in an area where people want to live, where people, there's the population pressure. So again, there's a fundamental that underpins that investment. And then finally, you'll hear people saying, we have vacant office blocks. Mm. Then I asked them, but how come you can't get vacancy mm. in offices in 14 Riverside mm. or at Yaya Center? Mm. Because Yaya has offices. Mm. It's because it's a mixed use development. You bring a retail, mm. you bring offices, you bring a hotel, you bring serviced apartment, all under one use. Mixed use does very well. That's why we've, we've purchased the four acres in. Kilimani. So at the end of the day, Saiton does only three things in real estate. Her current, because of uh, high-end education, uh, rapidly growing demographics such as Kiambu County, and mixed-use development. Now, I don't know which other developer can distill all the activity into clear buckets that are supported uh, by research. That's our differentiation. So picking the spot. Now, once you pick the spot, then the quality of product you have to put, uh, you put on them. I tell people, go look at the Alma mm. in Ruaka and tell me if you can find in that surrounding a better mm. uh, apartment community development. There's none. Go look at a marriage in Karen and tell me, can you find mm. another uh, quality of villa like what we have in a marriage? There's none. So you have to make sure that the delivery uh, is excellent. Everything we try to do at Saiton, we say, because we don't have heritage, godfathers, history, we'll only compete with the quality of our idea and commitment to its execution.
Thanks very much, Edwin. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot, Alikan. Thank you. Always a pleasure hosting you. Thank you. Thanks.